Right, so today's lecture is another case study where we are going to apply a lot of the concepts that we did in the last few lectures uh, to another complex problem. And uh, let me illustrate uh, the nature of the problem that we're going to deal with. This is the periodic table, okay. and iron is somewhere over there. And underneath iron we have ruthenium, osmium, and hassium. And these basically have the same outer electron structure as iron. So they are, uh, chemically, they are analogs of iron. These elements behave chemically similar to iron, but iron is the only one there which has a body-centered cubic crystal structure. All of these, these two have a hexagonal close back crystal structure, and that one occurs in such small quantities that we don't know what the crystal structure is. But the point is that hexagonal close back metals in general don't have good properties. So we are very lucky that iron has a body centered cubic crystal structure and the reason why it has that structure at room temperature is because it's ferromagnetic. The ferromagnetism contributes enormously to the free energy of iron and stabilizes the body centered cubic phase. <coughs> These atoms are larger and uh, because they are further apart, they don't have this interaction which leads to ferromagnetism, so they end up as hexagonal close back. If you do first principles calculations of the energy of the different crystal structures that you get in iron, and you ignore magnetism, you also predict that the ground state is hexagonal close back. So, we, given that we use approximately a billion tons of iron every year, and that is used in the form of body centered cubic crystal structure, we really have magnetism to thank for civilization as it, as it exists. Just remove iron from your life and you realize, uh, you know, we couldn't do all the things that we do right now. Now, the sort of uh, structures that we construct out of this body-centered cubic iron, uh, one of these is illustrated here. And this is an oil rig in the North Sea. And it extends a lot deeper under water than above water. And it's designed to withstand waves of approximately 50 meters high. Uh, and those waves are predicted to happen every so often, something like uh, 10, 15 meters a ton. How do you anchor something like that? Right. Now, th this one actually would be anchored with uh, steel, steel right onto the bed. Okay? But there is another design of an oil rig which can actually float and you either control its position with engines or with ropes, steel ropes. Okay. Now, the steel used here is extremely thick, uh, of the order of 80 to 100 millimeters thick. It's got to withstand a very corrosive environment and it's got to have enormous toughness because the temperatures here can get to close to zero degrees centigrade and it's a very expensive object. It's got to last for something like 25 years in service. Now, what we do with this structure when we fabricate it is we put defects in it. When you, whenever you weld in order to fabricate a structure like this, you put in localized heat. And that localized heat alters the structure that you produce by extremely careful thermomechanical processing. Okay, so you can produce really nice steel, extremely tough and so forth, and then you weld it. So you produce a whole gradient of microstructures, which, some of which may be detrimental. But this is the way you fabricate materials. So you can imagine the engineering challenge here. You've got to make this thing last for 25 years in a hostile environment, containing uh, heterogeneity induced by the <coughs> fabrication process. And because of the scale of these objects, the material that you use has to be a thousand times cheaper weight for weight than potato crisps. Mm -hmm. So there's no point in saying, look, I'm going to make this out of nickel-based superalloys. That simply won't do. They are incredibly expensive materials compared with this. So th this is really a remarkable achievement, the fact that these oil rigs actually work. So the cost of that superb steel is a thousand times cheaper than the cost of potato crisps weight for weight much cheaper than bottled water. Right, so this is an illustration of a simple sort of a welded joint. We have our 
transparent material here and you filled it in with three layers of molten metal using a, a process which introduces molten metal into a joint. Now, this is color etched to indicate gradients of microstructure. This region is called the heat affected zone because it remains solid but it absorbs heat from the welding process so you can see there are considerable structural changes there. This was the first layer of molten metal to be deposited. It is then heat treated by the second layer that you deposit and this final layer heat treats both those underlying structures. So this is an extremely complicated problem. And I'm going to focus today on this microstructure here, which is uh, what we call the primary microstructure. That is, that it hasn't been affected by heat from any subsequent layer that you deposit. But to treat the whole of this problem is extremely complex. Nevertheless, we can to a large extent predict the changes, the microstructural changes that happen there. And to some extent, we can also estimate the properties. So I'll focus today on this fusion zone microstructure. And the first that is first thing that you notice is that you know you can see these columnar grains here. It's almost like that uh, picture of an ingot that I showed you uh, early on, maybe uh, in the metallography, optical microscopy exercise, where you nucleate grains at the solid liquid interface, and then they grow along the direction of maximum heat flow. Heat flow. And this is a higher magnification image of those grains. So they are of the order of 100 micrometers wide. They have a shape of a hexagonal prism, that means a hexagon extending in one direction. And they are approximately 5 to 10 millimeters in length. Now, what do you think is the first phase to form when the steel solidifies? Sorry? That's a good guess, yeah? but iron is extremely strange because of the magnetism. That we actually have body center cubic phase stable at the highest temperatures. It then transforms to the cubic closed back ostina and then again to body center cubic. Uh, so, one part of the iron phase diagram that you're not, probably not familiar with, you've got carbon concentration here and temperature here. Uh, most people are familiar with this part of the phase diagram. So this is austenite, this is ferrite and austenite, and cement. Yeah. <coughs> this is the eutectoid temperature, about 7.3 degrees centigrade. But the higher temperature part of the phase diagram looks something like this. So this is also ferrite alpha, this is alpha plus liquid, and we have what's known as a peritactoid, a peritactic reaction, where alpha of this composition reacts with liquid of that composition to give you gamma, which is what you have here. Okay, so first you get solidification as alpha, which then transforms to gamma, which then transforms back into alpha. And that's entirely due to the strange magnetic properties of iron. Yeah. Not only is the ferrite magnetic, but the austenite itself has magnetic properties. They are very subtle magnetic properties, but extremely important mm -hmm. properties. So normally when you put a magnet to austenite, you can't attract it, right? If you take austenite to stainless steel, it won't be attracted by a magnet. But we can make austenite ferromagnetic. And indeed, at very high temperatures, uh, there is a Curie temperature, and at extremely low temperature, there's a Neal temperature corresponding to an antiferromagnetic transition. So, so first grains to solidify, uh, at least when the carbon concentration is less than this point, uh, are grains of delta ferrite. You nucleate austenite at the surfaces of those grains, and that austenite completely consumes the delta, so we end up with columnar grains of austenite. Uh, th this particular micrograph was taken by rapidly cooling from this temperature so that we preserve the delta. The delta to gamma transformation has been suppressed here. This is the austenite. 
So we end up with these columnar grains of austenite, which look like this in three dimensions, compared with the normal equiax grain structure that you are familiar with. Okay. Do you know what this object is called? Yeah, it's a tetrachidodecahedron. Basically, a mixture of these hexagons and uh, squares. Okay. And that's the best we can do to represent uh, the shape of an equiax grain. Uh, it's the best shape because it allows you to get to approximately 128 degree angles between the grain junctions. Yeah. Of course, they are not exactly 120 degrees because the shape is not consistent with 120 degrees, but it's the closest you can get to 120 degrees. And when you break open the grain structure, this is roughly correct. But when we talk about columnar grains, this is the right sort of shape. Uh, it's an anisotropic shape. So, this is the microstructure that we get when the austenite grains start to cool and transform. Uh, this is supposed to represent the grains of austenite. Uh, we first, when cooling happens below this temperature here, we get layers of allotromorphic ferrite forming. So you're familiar with allotromorphic ferrite? They go rapidly along the grain boundaries and more or less cover this grain boundary. Uh, as the temperature drops further, we get weedman and ferrite growing. And as the temperature drops even further, we get this strange looking thing, which is called acicular ferrite. But in fact, it's just bainite nucleated intragranularly on non-metallic particles. Welding is a dirty process compared with uh, making steels. Because when you deposit the weld, you know, you don't have all the protection that you give during steel making. The atmosphere gets into your molten metal and you end up with these non-metallic particles which help to nucleate transformation. Okay. So this is what the microstructure looks like schematically. And here is a, a real micrograph of the weld metal microstructure. You can see these layers of allotriomorphic ferrite along the austenite grain boundaries. You can see plates of weedman sardin ferrite here. And here we have the intragranularly nucleated bainite, or what we call acicular ferrite in the welding industry. Now, these layers of electromorphic ferrite are bad for the properties, because uh, if you look closely at those layers, they don't really contain any microstructure. And they get thicker and thicker. Uh, if they don't contain much microstructure, then a cleavage crack can simply propagate without deflection across that grain. So it's something we want to avoid. Uh, it's very convenient that they completely decorate the boundary because then we can treat the growth process as a one-dimensional diffusion control growth, exactly as we did the derivation in the lecture, uh, earlier lecture. So the thickness of the layer will vary parabolically with time, t to the power of a half. And this parabolic thickening rate constant contains all the diffusion coefficients that we discussed, contains information <coughs> from the phase diagram. You have the full equation which describes what alpha 1 means when we did the lecture on electromorphic ferrite. And here are some calculations for a typical welding alloy. Welding alloys will always contain a low carbon concentration because there's no possibility to do <coughs> heat treatments after you've done the welded joint. So if you put too much carbon, con carbon into your welding material, it's too hard and there's nothing much you can do about it, it's a bit brittle. So typical concentrations are in this, this range, very low carbon concentrations to maintain toughness. Whereas a normal steel, you can process, you can give it a heat treatment, etc. When you are making a huge oil rig, there's no possibility of giving it a heat treatment. Now, one thing I'd like you to notice here, which will be a feature of all of these uh, results, is that I'm changing the carbon concentration here in steps of 0.02 weight percent. Yeah, you can see that, right? But the effect on the kinetics of transmission is much smaller here than here. Any ideas why? Do you know roughly what the solubility of carbon in ferrite is? 
this point here. Yeah, it's very, very low, isn't it? About 0 0.028%. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Now, you remember we were drawing these concentration profiles at the alpha-gamma interface? Yeah. And we decided that this area is equal to this area here. Right? Mass balance. Now, if the far field concentration approaches this, okay. then we are partitioning very little carbon and the growth kinetics become incredibly fast. So what's happening here is that we are approaching the solubility of carbon in the ferrite, and once that, uh, once the equilibrium concentration of ferrite is equal to the average concentration in the other, there's no need for carbon to diffuse, and the growth rate really becomes very, very rapid. So if you look at your kinetic equations, for an X bar, which is the average concentration in your alloy becomes equal to the solubility in ferrite, we, we have problems, okay? Uh, the growth kinetics become infinitely fast. Now, of course, something else might limit the movement of the interface, for example, the transfer of atoms across the boundary. But nevertheless, as the solubility limit is approached, the kinetics will increase rapidly although not at an infinite rate, because some other process might become rate controlling. So, unfortunately, at the sort of carbon concentrations that you can use in a well metal, things become extremely sensitive to carbon, and the composition <coughs> of a welding alloy must be controlled very carefully, because say, the difference between 0.03 weight percent carbon and 0.05 is very large in terms of the kinetics of transmission. Now, of course, this is just the growth problem. I'm going to completely ignore the nucleation problem because, look, I've got two slides here. A thin layer forms extremely rapidly along the boundary. So let's assume that we start from an infinitely thin layer. We don't need to nucleate. We simply grow the layer. And we can test that assumption by plotting this rate constant versus the fraction of ferrite we get in a whole variety of welding alloys with different chemical compositions. And indeed, there is a strong correlation saying that the process is essentially controlled by growth. Nucleation can be neglected. So always when doing calculations like this, you shouldn't make the problem more complicated than is necessary. Now, there might arise circumstances where nucleation is important, but here we can basically assume that we start with an infinitely thin layer of ferrite and it simply grows one dimension. So, with all the theory that we've done, we can actually engineer the composition so that the layer of ferrite is not very thin. Because I said to you that this kind of ferrite is detrimental to the toughness of the valley color. Okay. Uh, this is just to show you that when the solubility of carbon in ferrite approaches the average carbon concentration, the growth kinetics, this term, tends towards 1, and diffusion control growth uh, becomes very rapid. Now, in the welding industry, they use empirical equations to decide whether a particular steel is uh, going to be valuable or not. And here's a couple of those empirical equations. Um, this is by the International Institute of Welding, where you work out a carbon equivalent from the chemical composition. So you take the weight percent of manganese, divide by six, and so forth. And they have discovered empirically that for high carbon steels, you need to use this equation to ensure that the weld is tough. And for low carbon steels, you need to use this equation. From the theory that you've done, you can explain these equations. Because look, when the carbon concentration is large, the manganese here is divided by 6. When the carbon concentration is small, the manganese doesn't have much of an effect. The reason is that the growth kinetics become extremely sensitive to carbon when the carbon concentration is small. So the other elements don't matter much. Okay. So what they have 
obtained by years and years of experience, you could explain with your phase transmission theory. Okay. Right, now, all the theory that, uh, almost all the theory that we've done is isothermal. That means we've calculated the growth rate at a constant temperature. But welding is not isothermal, obviously, because you want solidification to happen and for the heat to disappear. Uh, depending on what kind of process you use, uh, there will be many parameters which control the cooling curve. So, for example, if it is an arc well, then there's a welding current, the voltage, the speed at which you weld, and the temperature of the substrate at which you commence your welding. And there are many, many kinds of uh, heat flow models that you can use to calculate the cooling curve. So, for example, this is a typical cooling curve for an arc weld and you can see that the cooling process is over in a matter of tens of seconds so it's, it's quite rapid cooling and in order to treat transformation over a range of temperatures we have to integrate the thickness of the ferrite uh, integrate our equation over a range of temperatures but we need to know, you know at what point is that allotomorphic ferrite going to begin transformation and when is it going to finish transformation. So how can I work that out? If I ask you a general question that look I've got a steel, how do I know at what point during continuous cooling does transformation start and at what point does it finish? Is there any kind of information that you can look up? If I, if I ask you a question, you know, how, what are the kinetics of transformation of a particular steel as opposed to an equilibrium phase diagram, what sort of diagram would you think of? Yeah, a time temperature transformation diagram. So these are uh, typical calculated time temperature transformation diagrams where we plot the temperature versus the time required to initiate transformation. Uh, and we can do these calculations as a function of the composition of the steel. And then we can convert them into continuous cooling transformation diagrams because they are related. And from this we can work out the temperature at which transformation begins and at which it finishes. And therefore we can integrate that equation over that temperature range. Okay. Now, at some point the diffusion of ion atoms becomes very sluggish and a lot of ferrite transformation essentially ceases. And the only mechanism available then for transformation is displacer transformation. And this is Weidmann Salmon ferrite where I explained to you that Weidmann Salmon ferrite grows by a displacer mechanism. So you can see a shape deformation. Yeah. But at a rate which is controlled by the diffusion of carbon. So supposing I asked you, you know, what is uh, the growth, how does the length of the plate of Wiedemann's sun ferrite depend on time? What would be your answer? It's a displacive transformation controlled by the rate at which carbon diffuses ahead of the interface. So if I plot the length versus time, what sort of uh, a relationship should I observe? You, you would imagine that it should be parabolic because as, as we partition more carbon into the austenite, the gradient of carbon decreases. If you remember, for allotriomorphic ferrite, when we had a small amount of allotriomorphic ferrite, the gradient was steep. As the allotriomorphic ferrite became thicker, the gradient became gentle because we've always got this mass balance here. Right? Now, in the case of a plate shape, that isn't quite correct because when I have a plate, the plate is lengthening in this direction and we can leave the carbon behind. So essentially it's advancing into fresh austenite. So in fact we find that the length is proportional to time. We can do the diffusion control growth theory for a plate shape, it's not a problem. <laughs> Uh, I haven't gone into that theory, but you can see physically why we are not increasing the diffusion distance. The carbon is being left behind 
the blade. Okay? Yes. So, so going forwards is the uh, sideways that we also have uh, problem. That is a, that is a brilliant. Okay. I wasn't going to mention that, but of course here you are leaving behind the carbon, and the growth rate in this direction is parabolic, bit, right? But in this direction is uh, linear. Okay. So, at some temperature during the cooling process, uh, we stimulate the formation of Wiedemann stand ferrite. And once again, I'm going to assume that we don't need to nucleate this Wiedemann stand ferrite. We can treat the problem simply as a growth problem. Notice again that the growth rate is very sensitive to carbon as the carbon concentration becomes small. The other thing I'd like you to notice is that, look, the growth rate is at hundreds of micrometers per second. And this is again because it's, it's a plate shape and it's a displacive transformation. Now, I mentioned to you that the size, the, the width of a columnar grain of austenite is approximately 100 micrometers. So this transformation is over in a quarter of a second. Now, essentially you can treat it as an isothermal transformation because it doesn't happen over a large range of temperatures. Right? So, let's assume that everything is controlled by growth. If I now plot my uh, volume fraction of Wiedemann stand ferrite against the lengthening rate, I get virtually no correlation there. Okay, it looks like there's no correlation in the amount of Wiedemann stand ferrite I get against the calculated growth rate. Then you, you can prove that the calculated growth rate is correct by measuring the growth rate. But there's something wrong here. The volume fraction of Wiedemann stand ferrite that we get does not correlate with the growth parameter. So it may be that our nucleation assumption is wrong or something else is wrong. Well, the thing that is wrong is that by the time Wiedemann stand ferrite forms, there are other things happening as well. So let's imagine two scenarios. One in which the composition is such that the growth kinetics are rapid and one that the composition is such that the growth kinetics are slow. So this is a high alloy content and a low alloy. And this is the cross section of that hexagonal prism. So in the rapid transforming material, we have a thicker layer of electromorphic ferrite. Wiedemann side ferrite growth rate is very high. And these plates can cross the grain before anything happens inside the grain before the acicular ferrite or intragranularly nucleated vein can form. In this case, the growth of Wiedemann sand ferrite is stifled by impingement with intragranularly nucleated plates of vein. So we now can't think of phases forming in isolation. We've got to take account of physical interactions between transformations which are nucleated at different locations. Now, we haven't done the theory for this, but take my word for it, we can do it. And once we take account of those physical interactions, you know, obviously Wiedemann stand ferrite can't grow through the plates of acicular ferrite, we get very good agreement between calculations and predictions. This is just a higher magnification image of the non-metallic inclusions which stimulate the formation of these plates of acicular ferrite or intracardiolated nucleated vein. Now, you might argue that, look, here's a lot of plates where I can't see a non-metallic inclusion. So have they nucleated intragranularly, or what have they nucleated on? Would that be the right conclusion? That, look, very few plates actually form from particles. Well, it's probably particles that we can't see in different places. Very good, very good. You see, these particles are small. Let's assume they are one micrometer in length. Okay? These plates are large, 100 micrometers in length, right? So the chances of you finding a particle inside a plate is very small. And if you do a stereological calculation, you know, 7% of those plates might have an inclusion in a random cross-section. So always remember, you know, when you look at a two-dimensional section, that may not be representative of what you're looking at. 
So you have to do really careful work, work out probabilities, do lots of measurements to show whether or not every plate contains an inclusion. Okay. okay. We've done all the theory now. We've cooled the material to room temperature. And we can sit at the computer and do calculations of the microstructure as a function of the composition of the steel. And you can have you know, 20 different dialogue elements. I simply can't illustrate on this plot the effect of 20 different elements. So I've taken a very simple composition here. And this shows how the volume fractions of the phases will vary with the concentration of carbon. Okay. Of course, there are many other variables, like cooling rate and so forth, which I can't illustrate. But the point is that we can, using the phase transformation theory that you have done, do this kind of calculation. And therefore, we can design a welding alloy for particular purposes. We can look at its properties even. We can even estimate properties. So this is a, a calculation of the microstructure, just to show you the level of agreement that you can get between calculations and uh, experiments. Now, in part 1a and part 1b, you learned about the factors that affect strength, yeah. dislocations, precipitates, interfaces. All that theory can be combined with the microstructure calculations to estimate properties. So look, this is uh, the measured yield strength, calculated yield strength. These are what I call simple properties, that we have really good understanding of what controls strength. There are properties which we don't have a good understanding. So if you ask anybody in the world to calculate for you the fracture toughness of this, they could not do that. Okay? They can measure the fracture toughness, they have a feeling of what affects fracture toughness, so finer grain size is a good thing. But nobody can tell you that, look, the fracture toughness is 29 megapascal root meters. If I give you the full chemical composition, cooling curve, etc. So how do we cope with that? Uh, I, I don't have the time to go into this, but there are methods called neural network analysis. So you know, you know from your metallurgical experience, that a fine grain size is a good thing. It's not good to have large non-metallic inclusions. With these techniques, we can capture those patterns quantitatively okay, and then use those as models for estimating the other properties. So here, for example, is one of the most complicated problems. So we are estimating the toughness. Okay. Uh, this is uh, a, an impact transition temperature, contour of impact transition temperature. For many, many years, people thought, and you'll find this in all the textbooks, including uh, my own, that nickel improves the toughness of a steel. Okay? And people have proposed mechanisms and so forth. What this calculation shows is that that isn't generally true. So if I have an alloy with half of 8% of manganese, yes indeed, the toughness improves because impact transition temperature decreases as I add more nickel. But when I get to here, that isn't the case. And we now physically understand why that isn't the case. You know, a, a whole thesis has just been published on this subject. So it's only when you start to introduce quantitative numbers that you discover patterns in highly complex data because the number of variables involved is very large. In our brain, we can't imagine you know, the effect of 50 variables at the same time. So there are methods available to do even very complicated things. So let's assume we have everything in place now. And what we're going to do is we're going to design an actual product and market it. Uh, and of course, the need for this product has been identified either by the fact that you're constructing a power station and you don't have the right sort of material, or customers have said they require a welding material with certain properties. Uh, now you have all your or phase transformation models and so forth, but before you decide to make a new material, you also need the help from accountants. Okay? Because supposing you make a new alloy which only increases your profit by 1%, that's not going to be worth investment in a new technology. Right? So somebody has to give you, uh, the scientists, some guidance 
that look, this is worth actually doing and going into this market. So this is a project involving almost 25 people with different skills, including uh, you know, face transformation theory, accountancy, and so forth and so on. And the aim was to design, uh, according to the engineering requirements, a welding material which will be used in an extremely critical application to make a steam turbine. The steam turbines uh, experience temperatures of 600 degrees centigrade, steam temperatures, pressures which are very high, 130, uh, 130 bars, that means 130 atmospheres of pressure, and they're supposed to last for 25 years, rotating at 3000 RPM. Okay. And a few of the engineering requirements are these here, okay. specified by design engineers. And without doing any experiments, we predicted the composition of the weld which should work. And look, here are the results. Okay. And these were the electrodes that were made for welding. So it worked the first time. However, uh, Okay, I won't explain the problems that we had because <laughs> I haven't got the slides. But what we did was we did some. Uh, let me just find the slides. Here. It's quite interesting. So not not all theory works is what I wanted to point out to you. So everything looks rosy at this point, right? But we decided to do some additional experiments. You see, you have to heat treat the material because after welding, there are lots of stresses present. Yeah, because welding involves contraction. And if you have a large structure, then it can't accommodate that contraction. So you have huge stresses. And you get rid of them by stress relieving, heat treating. And this was a specified temperature. But we decided to do additional experiments and notice huge discrepancy between experiment and theory when we go to 700 degrees centigrade. So let's have a look at the microstructures of these cases. Okay, you can see the disagreement becomes larger and larger as I go at higher and higher temperatures, but this is really bad. Well, this is the microstructure. Don't worry about the details, just accept that this is the right microstructure which we wanted. But when we go to that really bad result, we've got recrystallization happening, which was never in any of the theory. So we, it's not surprising that we didn't predict it. Now, with this simple optical microscopy, you know what the problem is. So you can add a small amount of carbide-forming element, which will pin the boundaries and prevent the recrystallization. And then finally, you produce a commercial product. So in this case, there were actually two, you know, the first alloy, if you like, isn't safe enough to use for a very long time period, just in case recrystallization happens. But then, with the second iteration, you have a commercial product. <coughs> These are manual welding electrodes, so a person actually holds them and does, and they're much easier to produce. So when you make an experimental material, you start with this. But eventually, you know, it has to be automated. You can't afford to do manual welding, and it's also less reproducible than automatic welding. So this is a continuous electrode, and it's a commercial electrode. So the point I'm making, I've given you two case studies. Uh, we can't solve everything, but you can go a long way towards reducing the time required to develop a new material, and the cost required to do a new material. If you go back to the welding literature, about 40 years ago, the way you would have done this, you, you would have made a huge matrix of alloys and then tested them, and hopefully one or more would have the right properties. Okay, and that might take a very long time to actually do the experiment. But using phase transformation theory and certain other techniques, you can go a long way towards designing metallic alloys. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. Earlier on, when you had the um, right. Um, just to just notice on the 
the one for the very low carbons, mm -hmm. and you have um, boron. Because you, you said like um, they're divided by 20 of these because they're not very significant. That's right. But you have time, you have just five boron. Mm -hmm. You don't actually have that in this group. So let, let me just uh, find that. Now, when you reduce the um, carbon concentration, I explained to you the kinetics get fast, right? Now, sometimes they get incredibly fast, and you end up with a lot of bad microstructure. Okay? Uh, but if you increase the carbon concentration, you get a bad toughness. So what we've got to do is we've got to slow the reaction down. So in low carbon steels, sometimes you add things which segregate to the grain boundaries of austenite. Okay. So if those are the austenite grains. Boron atoms segregate to those boundaries. Now, the reason why they segregate is that there's more space at the boundaries. And in that process, they reduce the surface energy of austenite. Okay. So sigma is reduced. Now, what do you think that should do? Should that increase the nucleation rate of ferrite or decrease it? So this is the gamma gamma grain boundary energy. It's reduced by boron segregation. It should. It's not, there's not such great advantage. Yeah, exactly. You know, because when you when you have uh, heterogeneous nucleation, say I form ferrite here, I actually gain by eliminating this surface. But if that energy is reduced, then the austenite grain surface becomes a less favorable nucleation site. So you effectively increase the hardenability of your steel without adding more carbon. Okay. So boron is absent from this equation, you can see. But it, you know, low carbon steels, we sometimes add 20 parts per million of boron to have this effect. Okay. So boron absent from the first equation, yeah, you don't need it because you've got sufficient hardenability. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, excellent.